the whole, yeah. All right. It says that it's not working. really annoying. We'll just assume that it's going to work. No big deal. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, get the ball rolling. We are uh, in John chapter 20. Uh, today we're going through verses 19 through 23. So uh, John 20, verse 19. That evening, on the first day of the week, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his side. They were filled with joy when they saw their Lord. He spoke to them again and said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Then he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. Sorry about that. Okay. Our signal's okay because Jacqueline can see it. So, um... Let's, uh, let's just uh, take a quick stroll down memory lane. Uh, last week, where were we? We were in the garden. We were with uh, Mary Magdalene as she uh, finally has the courage to peek down into the tomb. She sees two angels standing there. And then she suddenly has this uh, person appear next to her. She thinks that he's the, the gardener, right? And what is, she, what is she looking for? Why is she in the garden? Yes, yes. She was going to make the body spicy. She was going to uh, prepare the body properly for burial. That's what she was trying to do. And her plea to this person that she thought was the gardener was, where have you taken him? Where is my Lord? Uh, and then when the gardener says... Mary, she recognizes who he is and clings to him. Now, he told her to do something very specific. What was that? Besides let go. Yes, yes, he did say let go. And then she let go, and he told her to go do something. Tell the disciples. So... Now we meet up with the disciples. Uh, according to what we've read, it's the same evening, and it happens to be the first day of the week. So, the same evening, she has met with the disciples and said, hey, this is what Jesus said. Now, the disciples, as we find them, are gathered together. Um, let's, just, let's just think about their mindset at this point in time. What's, what's taking place? Their master, their friend, the person they've traveled around with for the, the past you know, three plus years has been killed, murdered, crucified publicly so everybody could see. Um, they, didn't, they didn't try to help him escape, well, with maybe one exception, but you know, that was put a stop to. But instead, what happened? In the garden, what's that? He stepped out. When he was taken, what did they do there? They ran. So their, their teacher, their master, their friend, the person they've traveled around with for three years, instead of doing anything to support him in this time, they ran. So there's probably a little bit of disappointment in themselves, right? Think about those big moments when you could have taken a stand. Instead of taking a stand, you step back from it. 
didn't quite have the courage to do what you thought you should be doing. So there's some disappointment there. They're probably a little angry, right? He said that he was the Messiah, that he was going to save us. And look what happened to him. There may be maybe a little scared, right? It says right here in the passage that they're scared. Who are they scared of? The Jewish leaders. And they have, I would say they have every right to be scared of the Jewish leaders. Because look at what the Jewish leaders have accomplished here. They've taken a man who was completely innocent of the crime that he's accused of. They have taken, they have produced witnesses against him to falsely accuse him. The, the Roman authorities find no fault in Jesus, but they manage to get him killed. And now, I mean, they've been traveling around with him for the last three years. It's not hard to believe that, you know, when you see one of them, you immediately think of, oh, Jesus. Right? I mean, one of them even experienced that before he died. Do you remember that story? Denied him three times. Right? So Peter experienced being associated with Jesus, and he denied it. So they're scared. They're disappointed in themselves. They're angry at Jesus. They're part of whatever conspiracy that Jesus was part of. So it's understandable that they might be uh, a little afraid. So they're inside this building. The doors are locked. I... I just want to let the, the doors are locked means that the, the windows are probably shut, so it's probably a little dim. Edison hadn't invented the light bulb yet. Well, hadn't improved upon the light bulb to make it commercially viable. I saw a program last night. So there's you know some candles going, and they got a lot to discuss. I mean, Mary, as they're feeling all this, Mary has come back to them and has said, Hey, Jesus said that he's alive. Jesus has told me to come to you. He has said that you are to do what he has done. You are to be one with him as he is one with the Father. So they're discussing this. They're thinking about this. And as they're discussing this, I've got this whole thing played out of my head. As they're discussing this, boom. Boom. Jesus is there. And he says to them, peace be with you. Now remember, this is an English translation. So what he said was probably shalom. Shalom is a standard greeting, but it is a sincere greeting that does literally mean peace be with you. So even in the simple things, as they're in the midst of their fear as to their situation, as they deal with this anger, this frustration, this mixed emotion, they, yeah, emotion, I don't know about that one. As they deal with all of this, there's that commonality. There's that peace be with you, that standard greeting. And it's coming from the very person that they're a little bit angry at, that they're probably a little bit uh, worried, you know, because... Oh, we ran. So there's this fear that they're dealing with. Fear of the Jewish leaders. Maybe, oh, Jesus is here. Uh Uh-oh. We didn't, you know. I know we spent three years with you, but, you know, we didn't pay attention. It wasn't evidently clear to us what was going on. So fear. Let's take a look at fear for a little bit. Everybody deals with fear a little bit differently. Now, this is a little bit of a dated reference, 
but there's a, a humorist, a comedian, Dave Barry. He says that all of us are born with a set of instinctive fears. The fear of falling, fear of the dark, the fear of lobsters, the fear of falling into a lobster tank in the dark, speaking before a rotary club, and the words, some assembly required. Instinctive fears that all of us deal with on a regular basis. Some of us like that, that adrenaline rush that comes with fear, so we do things like we watch horror movies. We watch scary movies. Of course, scary movies can't even you know, stick to the script themselves. I mean, you have movies like The People Under the Stairs that are more funny than horror. You have Scream, which is an entire franchise based on being funny about horror. But this fake fear that is manufactured for us gives us that little bit of a rush of adrenaline, gives us that jolt. Uh, if you're on a date, it gets you a little bit closer. It's fear utilized for something. This fear that they're feeling is not the same as that. This, is, this isn't a real fear either. It's, it's not that little bit of a jolt. It's the kind of fear that makes you do crazy things. Right? So this is, uh, well, I don't know. I wouldn't say so much crazy. No. I, what I'm thinking of, it, it, because I, watched, I watch a lot of programs, right? So in addition to the fact that Edison didn't invent the light bulb, he just made it commercially viable, I also watched this thing on the stock market because, you know, money. So did you know that the price of gold even has a fear index? So as more people buy into gold, this fear index rises. And what this is basically is people worried about the health of the U.S. dollar. We're not talking about these false things that are set up. They are, they are dealing with a very real fear. But let's think about this fear that they're feeling. They've walked around with them for years. They've seen tons of miracles, right? They've seen sick people healed. They've seen uh, blind people become sighted again. Mute people talk. They've seen uh, the lepers with visible sores healed. The lame people walk. They've seen him walk on the water. They've seen him even, I know this is crazy, they've even seen him raise somebody from the dead after three days being dead. They saw Lazarus. They knew what was going on. But here are the disciples they're sitting. They've, they find themselves to be a failure. They feel maybe a little betrayed, right? He said he was the Messiah, yet he's dead. They're a little confusion, a little disappointment, some shame, some guilt. If you read through the context in John 20, it's clear that they've really misunderstood the majority of what Christ had told them during his life. Now, they had even a clearer picture than, than most people. They spent so much time with him. They, he took them aside and, and taught them extra. But even they misinterpreted some of these miracles. They've even been misdirected by their own culture, right? Because the Messiah, for the majority of the Jews, wasn't somebody that was just going to come and save them, but was someone that was going to restore their nation was going to fight this glorious battle that would take out the Roman Empire so the Jewish nation would be able to stand again on its own, not be subjugated. The Messiah was going to be a great warrior. This is what it had turned into in their minds. So you've got this misunderstanding of all of these things mixing together. So it makes sense that they were afraid, but this fear is not a real fear, right? A real fear is like what we're taught to, to fear God. That's a real fear. It's a different kind of fear. This fear 
is, well, I work uh, for the government. We love acronyms. So we're taking away fear and we're turning it into an acronym. This is false evidence appearing real. Right? So this false evidence that appears real is the fact that the Messiah is gone, is dead. That the person that they ran around with for the past three years wasn't who he said he was. And now, as they're sitting there milling around in this, what happens? He's there. Very much alive. Very much the same person. In order to prove that he's the same person, that he's real, he holds up his hands. So they can look through them. He shows his side so they can see the wound in the side. I'm here. And instead of, what were you thinking? Where were you guys? Why didn't you have my back? Which is what they would maybe expect to hear. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. I know you're afraid. I know you're worried. You're scared, the Jewish authorities. I'm still here. Peace be with you. So just as Josh talked about the difference between truth and what's that what's that key that we kept saying? What's the what's the, the phrase? Anybody remember it? What's what's the the uh, what is truth? Eke Claritas. Right? Transforming this false evidence that appears real, these facts, making them subject to what is real, changing them to fit the truth of the matter. This fear was real for them, just like fear is real for us. Sometimes it comes because we don't understand. Sometimes it comes because we are afraid. It's because we are disappointed in our own actions. We should have done this, but instead we back down. I should be like this, but instead I'm only like this. I have this high standard in my mind, and I should live up to it, but I just can't seem to. We're in the process of being who we are supposed to be, who we already are. And in that process, we are going to fail sometimes. We are going to struggle with that. We're going to disappoint ourselves. We are going to not meet up to that standard sometimes. because we don't understand, because all the facts seem to be against it, because we're scared. In the midst of all of that, Jesus says, peace be with you. Forgiveness is demonstrated by his very greeting to them, by his very actions. There's no recrimination. As far as they're concerned, they've betrayed him by running. But he demonstrates forgiveness. And then, as a further demonstration of his forgiveness, he gives them a task to do. He sets them up. It is demonstrated by the gift that he gives them. Just like God breathed the breath of life into Adam, Christ breathes into them the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
gives them a new purpose, a new direction. He has breathed them into a new life. Now, some of you may be confused because we talk about um, Acts 2. We talk about you know, Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming upon it. We talk about that being the first act where you really see the Holy Spirit interacting when the Holy Spirit came upon them. But this is where the Holy Spirit comes. What we see in Acts 2, let me just turn there real quick. What we see in Acts 2, uh, on the day of Pentecost, seven weeks after Jesus' resurrection, the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in another language as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. What you see here is not necessarily them getting the first touches from the Holy Spirit, but what you see here is the first time the Holy Spirit has moved them. They could not help themselves but to speak out and declare the gospel that they have been told to share. Not only could they not help themselves, they were doing it in languages they didn't even understand to begin with. What you see in Acts 2 is the first time the Spirit has compelled and moved them to do something. What you see here in John is them receiving the gift of the Spirit for the specific purpose of forgiving people, for discerning who needs to be forgiven, for discerning what needs to take place in people's lives. What they've been given in John 20 is the power to go out and do what Christ has done for his life. For those three years plus that he was with them. For the opportunities that they had to witness him healing people, him making the lame to walk, Not by telling them, hey, get up, take your mat and walk. But to say, your sins are forgiven. They have moved beyond the point of being afraid. He's telling them, don't be afraid. Not only don't be afraid, but go out and do this. Now, what does this call for them to do? They've been... They've been told that uh, they're receiving the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. And if you refuse to forgive them, they are unforgiven. So, they can't sit there afraid of the Jews in their little house anymore. They can't sit there with the windows shut up, with the dim light from the candles. They can't sit there and just talk amongst themselves about, wow, so Mary says that he's back? The tomb was empty? What's that mean? It's time to move beyond that. They've been given a goal, something to do. Their fear should no longer be an issue for them. Their fear is gone. The person that, in reality, they were most afraid of has come back to them and said, Peace be with you. So Jesus has indicated his forgiveness by authorizing them to carry out the work that he himself had begun. He doesn't just send them, but he enables them. He authorizes them. He gives them his authority. So after the fear, you see the forgiveness, and then you begin to see faith. A faith restored. So into that room walked someone that they thought that they would never see again because they didn't understand. So there's hope that is springing fresh from that darkness, that oppression that's on their hearts. They witness their master, their Lord, the Messiah.
Messiah alive. They have something very real to restore their faith. So while we may all deal with this fear on a regular basis, why we sometimes fall short of the marks that are set for us, the the marks that we even set for ourselves sometimes, why we get disappointed if we misunderstand what's going on around us as we delve into that false evidence that appears real. Christ is there. Give us that peace to absolve the fear, to show that He's forgiven us, to give us that task, to get us moving in the direction we need to be moving. See, we've been given the gift. We've been given the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit moves us sometimes. It's that prompting that we hear sometimes. And sometimes it's such a loud voice, you can't plug your ears from it. So the question you need to ask yourself is are you disappointed? Do you understand? Are you afraid? You're going to find yourselves in situations on a daily basis where there's the potential to back down in fear. There's the potential to not feel like you you lived up to the the mark that you were aiming for in that. There's the, the potential to not live your life to the fullest. You don't need to be afraid of those things. You don't need to fear those things. Exchange that false evidence that appears real for real fear. Fear of God. This isn't a debilitating fear. It's a liberating fear. Accept the forgiveness that is there. We've missed the mark. Now don't dwell on that. Enough. Let's move on. We've all been given a task. We've all been directed to do something. And we've been given the gift to help us to achieve that. Now next week, as has been foretold by uh, both the the prophets of the church, I will be talking about Thomas. And we will be discussing faith. We'll be discussing what exactly that means and what exactly it takes for you to have that faith. But today... I want to make sure that it's clear that we don't need to be huddled in a room filled with fear. We don't need to worry about the Jews, whoever our Jews may be. That's been taken care of. We are asked to be emboldened. We too have been given something that we need to do. We've been given a task. And instead of being crippled by fear or misunderstanding or doubt in ourselves, we can realize that it's bigger than that. That those things don't matter. We have all the tools at our hands. We have been given the breath of new life because of what took place on that cross. Because of what took place 
after the cross. Let's pray. Father, I just pray for the the stamina, the peace of mind, for the the wherewithal, the the will to to do what has been placed before us. We pray that uh, we would not be crippled by fear, that we would uh, seek out the wisdom that you have uh, given to us, that we would understand those things that are going on around us, that we would not back down, that we would understand what the truth is. We would not let we would not let these things that people throw forth as, as facts blind us to what is real, Lord. We just thank you so much for the gift that has been given to us. And we pray that we would we would go out so that others can understand the gift that has been given to them as well. I pray this in your son's name. Amen. That taught my heart.